and able to participate in the conference call today. Um, I just want to welcome <clears throat> all of you who have joined us. Thank you very much. And I'm going to read um, um, and cover a few of the items that we think will be um, top of mind for, for a lot of you based on some of the questions we're receiving. And then we will open it up for questions like we did this last time. Um, and uh, Carolyn Thompson is going to collect some of those, synthesize them um, as well, and then uh, we'll address them each one by one. Um, all right, let's get started. Uh, I think that many of you may already know, but if you do not, we are now up to 17 confirmed cases in Oklahoma of the coronavirus. The health department launched a new website specifically to address COVID-19. And I'll give you uh, that site. It is coronavirus.health.ok.gov. Also, OSDE is compiling resources on our website. If you want access to that, it would be um, the quickest way is to go to sde.ok.gov forward slash coronavirus and you will see some of the tools that we have there we'll be adding to those shortly. I want to address uh, some of the reason behind the decision for the school closure statewide. Uh, first and foremost, this was about student safety and the well-being of those who serve in schools, their families, our children, of course. And it is also um, very well understood that Many, many of Oklahoma grandparents are um, also raising children. They're raising their grandchildren. And uh, this is a factor as we think through what we need to do to protect that m very vulnerable population, as well as many in Oklahoma with a um, uh, suppressed immune system and um, other um, medical conditions that would make their um, um, positive testing for coronavirus, something that would be quite quite difficult for them to overcome. We also had a change in the guidance from the SDE, I'm sorry, the CDC and the White House guidance uh, for gathering of not more than 10 people. Uh, but also I think the most compelling reason was I do believe we reached a place of community transmission in Oklahoma. And uh, this is something that we have said from the beginning uh, that we would do. And we stepped in to do that, and um, our board was more than willing to support that in an emergency measure. I do want to clarify that uh, the dates for the cessation of school and the uh, closure are currently from today, March 17th, through April 5th, or until April 6th. So the returning date is scheduled right now for April 6th. But the board will be meeting on March the 24th. I'm sorry, excuse me. They will be meeting on March the 25th. That is next Wednesday. And we will consider at that time any extensions. Also, it is a statewide cessation of all school activities with very few exceptions uh, or exclusions, excuse me. and. Um, those would include, um, let's see, um, if, with very few exclusions, meaning that there's only going to be a limited um, ability to do school uh, work, which would include essential functions, um, including food services, janitorial services, clerical and administrative services. Um, these are some of uh, the very few things that would be continuing. The allowance for staff to continue to work was intended to provide a mechanism by which support staff could put in hours and be paid for those hours. Um, however, only essential administrative and clerical staff can be required to report. I also would like to address teacher pay as we've received many questions about this. Um, particularly on social media. I think there's a real need to help clarify that. And that is that yes, during a statewide closure, teachers and administrators will continue to be paid. 
the statute reads, quote, teachers and administrators shall be entitled to pay for any time lost when school is closed on account of epidemic or otherwise when an order of such closing has been issued by a health, of, a health officer authorized by law to issue the order, end of quote. Now, support staff is another matter and an area of, of concern for us. So we are engaged with the legislature right now for some type of statutory remedy. And I just want you to be aware of that. Um, we, we are very pleased with the um, collaboration being offered uh, with the leaders in uh, the legislature. Um, substitute pay is undetermined. Uh, we are looking into issues for long-term subs as well, but again, these are different um, scenarios that we believe are worth considering, and uh, that is unknown at this time whether that would factor into any type of legislative remedy. Um, another area to address is the decision to include virtual schools. Uh, as this is a statewide system of schools, it's important to take every precaution regarding the health of those who meet the students in any public school, which include blended and virtual schools. The state cannot carve out unique exceptions during a state or during, excuse me, a national state of emergency or response to a world pandemic. And so this was part of our immediate step. Moreover, an um, inconsistent approach would impact requirements for students with IEPs and English learners. And it is very likely, for example, that students on IEPs would be required to receive services when it would be difficult to ensure their safe uh, continuation. Uh, additionally, there are emergency provisions that can only be leveraged in a statewide closure. For example, the ability for all teachers to continue to be paid in the event of an epidemic. Also, despite the fact that teachers in virtual schools do not frequent, have frequent contact with their students, um, they do with school staff and uh, with each other in some cases as well. All right, so um, at this time, um, I just, I want to First, thank you. I, I want to thank all of those. Uh, we have, it looks like, uh, about 548 on the call at this moment, uh, or now it's, it's more than that. Um, it's continuing to climb, but I do want you to know that um, we want this to be as um, helpful as possible, and um, I just feel that as you write in questions that we can answer uh, today, uh, we'll do so if we have need to review it further, we will add that to FAQs or uh, address that on the next call. Uh, so at this time, are we ready with some questions? We're ready. Uh, Superintendent, we've had a couple of questions about um, certain scenarios where instructional activity might be able to continue. The press is reporting that instructional activity must cease, and there's been questions about certain online activities being able to continue during the closure. Yes, and uh, that is not in sync with the motion that was made and approved. So um, I'm looking for that language. Brad, do you have it? About the operations? Yes. Uh, the motion. Yeah. Okay. Is this it? Up top and then continues down here. Okay, why don't you read that? Yep. So, uh, yesterday's action by the State Board of Education uh, was effective relating to all accredited public schools to cease operations um, during the dates that the superintendent mentioned a few moments ago. Uh, the operations that were included in that motion uh, relate to instructional activities and others. So, for purposes of the first question, uh, instructional activities means face-to-face -face and uh, distance learning online, virtual, however you want to to uh, describe it, but those are included in the um, cessation. Uh, and, and along those same lines, could you clarify what jobs are considered essential? Yeah. Um, Go ahead. Uh, a 
lot of this is, is determined locally, but um, I think for purposes of the motion, we put in that essential clerical and administrative activities can include business management, so encumbrance clerk, uh, human resources uh, functions, fiscal services and governance, if boards of education um, need to meet, as well as child nutrition and other maintenance type services. Thank you. Um, it's still several questions along um, uh, these lines and specific to what can and can't happen during the closure. Superintendent, you mentioned teacher pay. Um, have questions about um, does it matter what source the teacher is paid from? Um, you know, if they can continue to receive their pay, whether or not they're state-funded teacher or federally funded teacher. I, I think at this time, uh, the guidance that we will be putting out will address um, that question. I'm not in a position to, to answer that in full detail at this point, but uh, I would anticipate that that's covered. Okay. Um, question about extracurricular activities. Can students continue to participate in a practice if it is not required? So if, they, if schools want to make practice an option, can students participate in that? No, we would view that as an extracurricular activity. And we've been um, keeping close communication with um, OSSAA and Dave, David Jackson, and um, we, we've been very clear about that. Um, could you talk a little bit about IEP meetings? Do IEP meetings still need to occur during the closure? Um, we also have Todd Lofton here, and uh, I'll just go ahead and address that, but the answer um, during this period of time would be no. Could you address that further? IEP meeting annual due dates are still in place, and so are any eligibility meetings. The USD has been pretty clear about that. Obviously, there may be issues um, having an IEP meeting anyway. Any IEP meetings that are due during this time, and schools can determine wh which IEPs will be due through pulling a report on Ed Plan. Um, immediately upon returning to school, IEP meetings should be held. But and can you? Uh, I think we would need to address if the school closure lasts beyond the 10 days. I think that would be something to address in um, FAQs. Yeah. Unless you can. Right, address that because now. schools should be in contact with parents and at least you know do their best to make sure they're communicating with parents if an IP due date is coming up like next week, for example, and what they're going to be doing and scheduling it for afterwards. So um, just to clarify, do they need to have IEP meetings now or should they wait until the closure is potentially over? Or, you know, in the case that the closure continues, is there advice for whether or not the IEP meetings need to be be done now or whether they could maybe be done virtually or over the phone? Is there any advice on that? I mean, if they could be done virtually or over the phone, then we, we cannot do that. can't do it. No, I would, I would say that the board's order uh, from yesterday was relating to all instructional activities. Um, this, the issues about change of placement and so forth, the, that was addressed in the guidance we put out last Thursday uh, relating to 10 consecutive school days or fewer, such that those would not apply. But uh, I think we're looking at you know, instances of beyond that, and, and we will address that further right. in the guidance we put out later. So let's switch topics a little bit. We've got several questions about state testing, um, uh, people asking about the testing window. Would it be moved? Will it continue? Should schools continue to prepare for the state test as if they're going to be given? Um, could maybe you just describe a little bit of what's possible as far as state testing is concerned? Regarding state testing, uh, this is something that for the for the moment, um, nothing has changed, but we do believe that looking forward and looking at 
um, what we can anticipate right now, there is a likelihood that this will be an extended um, time of, of closure. And even if there is a period where schools attempt to um, deliver services in, a, in an alternative way, um, I have real concerns about um, bringing our students back uh, for um, statewide assessments without any type of guarantee yet of uh, what that picture looks like related to how many students would be testing, what kind of um, uh, environment we would be talking about to prepare them to get ready. And uh, we're going to uh, take this matter to the board. Um, we anticipate that we'll have greater clarity around testing in um, our March 25th board meeting. Um, we've got uh, additional questions about staff and pay, um, questions about whether a, a para, if they're considered instructional staff, could be paid um, or not, and whether support staff could use their sick leave or support staff could be placed on admin leave um, in order to allow them to continue to be paid. Yeah, um, and Carolyn, you may want to answer part of this, but I, I think part of what we were discussing earlier and part of what we were looking at is the solution for uh, support staff and whether they could be included on administrative uh, leave pay. Uh, I think those things are to be further discussed and determined, but just know that we are actively uh, looking for solutions around that. And I think this is Carolyn. I think it's um, uh, appropriate to say that um, we just this morning at the uh, department have visited with a number of legislators about a possible fix for support staff um, as, as there doesn't seem to be um, a, a legal option for that right now for those individuals to continue to be paid. So um, we're talking to legislators about that and there seems to be um, desire to provide that. So we will um, continue to be working on that and hope that we have a fix for that that we can share soon. Um, Superintendent, um, can you share whether or not um, regional accreditation officers will still be um, making visits? Will they still be coming to schools um, and should schools uh, plan to see them? Okay. Um, I will, I'm not certain that there will be um, a well-considered answer here, but Monty is over the REOs, so I'll let Monty answer that. Yes, I've been working with uh, Ryan Popper, our executive director, and we're, they're, they're going to be getting in contact with you in the next few weeks. They're officing at home right now. They still have their state uh, cars. So as we work through this and see what the extent of it is, I know we have accreditation audits that will need to take place at some time. So they're going to be working with you all. Uh, there are some uh, districts that have that may be prepared for that, and we may be able to work something out to go ahead and, and expedite some of those things as we go on, but uh, you'll be working with your individual REOs and we will work our schedule around what works for the districts to get to get all of those things done so that we're not trying to do multiple things throughout the summer uh, as we go on. But, uh, but we are looking to proceed in places that we can and in, with those school districts that uh, are prepared for us, we'll go ahead and move forward. All right, very good, thank you. Um, I, I don't think we've addressed um, this particular point yet, but a question about whether or not the days will be required to made up, and is there any expectation that we can give to districts about whether or not they'll need to make up the days for the closure? Um, that's another uh, piece that I want to take to the board on March the 25th, so uh, we'll address that at that board meeting. Okay, we have a couple of um, nutrition questions. Um, Jennifer, if you're ready. Sure. Um, do you want to uh, make any comment about the waiver um, to allow those who are below the 50% free and reduced price lunch um, to be able to um, participate in, in feeding their kids? Would you like to make any comment about that waiver? That waiver has been submitted and has not been approved. That waiver has been approved submitted to USDA and has not been approved yet. So
so we are waiting for that. Um, and until we get it, that's what we have to follow, that requirement. So to be clear, if you're below the 50%, you cannot participate in the flexibilities that are currently available? We have a way to check some census data, and we are doing that as well. If a school applies and they don't come up as meeting the 50% require and reduced, free and reduced requirement by site, we are allowed to use some census data, and we are checking that as well. We're exhausting all options at this point to get everyone to be able to participate. Um, it might also be a worth, worth a mention at this point that we have raised this issue with our um, uh, two U.S. Senators um, and are asking them um, if they would advocate on our behalf um, either for that waiver or for a fix in the, um, the bill that's making its way through Congress right now for support um, during this time. Also, I'll mention that at 3 o'clock we have a conference call with uh, the U.S. Department of Ed and U.S. Department of Ag. So um, I think this will be the topic of conversation um, as well. Okay, uh, Jennifer, continuing on um, child nutrition, um, do you expect any waivers to allow schools to serve two meals at one time? For example, if they're delivering, could they deliver two meals at the same time? That waiver is being submitted today. Very good. Okay. Um, all right, we have more questions coming in. Um, there are a lot of concerns about um, emergency certified teachers that might be on their two year. Um, people have acknowledged that there's a bill making its way through the process that would allow for an extension, but given the state of the legislature right now and uncertainty around that, is there any um, thought given to possibly extending the board, extending the two year, um, if for some reason that bill um, wasn't was unable to make it through the process? Is that something that we're discussing? Please. Uh, yeah, I, I think that would be definitely be one of the considerations to be given um, and taken to the state board, whether that's at the March meeting or or just after that. Yeah, the answer is yes. Um, and we've also had questions about whether certification testing is going to continue um, from OEQA. Uh, last we heard, there were not um, extensive closures of a certification testing site, but that was a few days ago, and that may have changed. So if there are questions about certification sites um, uh, staying open for the your OSAS or, um, or whatever test you may be taking, you might uh, reach out to OEQA for uh, information about that. Um, Jennifer, uh, follow up here. Could you um, go ahead and clarify um, uh, again whether the 50% free and reduced is based on the district as a whole or by the site? By site. Okay, so the 50, you have to be 50 above 50% at the site level. If the elementary in your district qualifies the 50% free and reduced and the middle, the school that those elementary kids would feed into meet does not, that site can qualify as well because the elementary site that those kids feed into do. So I'm going to use Edmund as an example just because it's off the top of my head. Edmund has two elementaries that qualify, so the middle school for both of those elementaries and the high school for both of those elementaries could serve meals as well. So we still have a lot of questions about IEPs. I don't know if there's any additional information that can be provided I think on IEPs. that will be definitely included okay. in the updated um, FAQs as well. Okay. We, we, we know there's a need for specificity and uh, we'll provide that. We have a, um, questions about um, school events that might be planned after or immediately after the April 6th date. Schools are trying to figure out whether or not they should plan on continuing to have those things like proms and things like that that might be scheduled in, in mid-April. Um, even though the shutdown is through, or until, excuse me, until April 6th. Is there advice for schools on how to be thinking about that? Well, first of all, um, this is an unprecedented time, and we have CDC guidelines that have been given um, that are separate and apart from the date for our statewide school closure. Um, and that is something that is yet to be determined when these, this changes day by day. So it's hard to predict what uh, we will be doing 
in uh, in the mid March, or I'm sorry, mid April time period. But we want very much for our schools to be thinking creatively right now on how to honor uh, what is a very special time for our students. Um, this includes graduation as well, but the idea of a large scale um, activity with, which would include um, a, lo a lot of young people being together or families being together in one large location, I think is going to have to be really rethought. So um, a couple of other clarifications. Um, so let's say um, a school wanted to bring in support staff that isn't necessarily their cafeteria staff, but use them to help to prepare meals. Would those um, support staff be allowed to be paid for that? Yes, we, we do think that is allowable. Uh, so similarly, um, paraprofessionals, could they also participate in something like that if school wanted to bring in others and, and pay them in order to support yes, those absolutely. functions? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, question about school construction. Um, if you have construction going on in your school right now, are those projects allowed to continue if the school is closed? I think that that is a question that's separate from what we uh, think about when we are talking about a um, school closure involving the items that were listed. Um, there are timelines that are part of projects and bonds, and, and we understand that, and that is an, an essential sure. piece. Sure, and following the CDC guidelines of, of 10 or fewer, you know, I think those get into factual determinations. Is um, question about providing possible instructional resources, educational resources, instructional materials. In, uh, providing instructional materials to students during this time, if, if a teacher wanted to try to support their students by providing some sort of instructional materials or encouraging them to do any of their online work that they already have access to, is that allowable? Uh, not in a formal way. Um, I saw someone on Facebook that was reading a, a story. She posted um, a book to her, her students on Facebook and they could read it and stay in touch with her. Um, I think that this is, we, I don't mean for this to become um, something that is so deeply micromanaged, um, but the, the difference is that there is a, um, a compelling of teachers and an expectation for grades and assignments to be given and um, operations to be done. That is what we have said no to. So along those lines, counselors that might be working with students who are looking at colleges um, and providing advice to them, are those activities allowable? <laughs> I think the way to answer that is to go back to the, <clears throat> excuse me, the vote of the State Board of Education yesterday, which was no instructional activities, uh, grading, extracurricular activities, staff development. Uh, but again, if, if an individual wants to voluntarily work with with somebody, I don't think that's anything that we are interested in policing, for, for lack of a better way to put it, uh, at this time. Um, Jennifer, could you talk a little bit about um, the CACFP um, uh, waiver? We've submitted a waiver um, specifically right now for CACFP for uh, those entities that are conducting the at-risk program under CACFP because that program does require congregate feeding as well and it requires an enrichment component for the program. I have submitted a waiver to get the congregate feeding requirement waived as well as the enrichment requirement. That was submitted uh, Monday morning, I believe. <laughs> that one was submitted Monday morning. I worked on it over the weekend. Um, that one I know has been sent to national office already, um, so we're waiting on that. The other one I will be submitting for CACFP is meal pattern flexibility uh, because they are having a hard time, these small centers are having a hard time getting food at the grocery store that meet meal patterns. But at this time there's not a waiver, so if meals are served under CACFP, they must meet meal pattern requirements to be claimed. Are districts allowed to provide a third meal if they're currently providing the third meal and using that option? Can they continue that? 
Well, again, that would require me getting the waiver for the um, at-risk program to waive the congregate feeding. So at this time, schools can only do two meals, a combination of breakfast and lunch, a lunch and a snack. They cannot do supper and lunch. That combination is not allowed per regulations, and that, that has not been waived. Um, and the two meals that they can, or the lunch meal for sure will be reimbursed at the free rate as well. Um, is uh, our district allowed to use local money to pay, pay for meals um, in the meantime? Yes, if they're not a if they're not a site currently that meets the 50%. Uh, my understanding, and we can get further clarification on this as well, and put it in that FAQ. Um, my understanding is they can use non-federal funds to cover that, but not child nutrition federal funds. Very good. Um, can concurrent enrollment continue um, uh, if the call if let's say the college has gone to all on an all online platform? Can that continue? Yeah, this is something that I would anticipate being covered in the guidance that we'll put out later. But um, at this point, the answer is yes. Um, concurrent enrollment classes, as everyone is well aware of, that those are designed and operated through the state regions, and so uh, the short answer is yes. I'm trying to weed through. We've got a lot of duplicates here. On on child nutrition, uh, Jennifer and her staff have been working just enormous hours to process everything. And we would just ask that if the districts could coordinate, because we have great uh, managers and helpers in our cafeterias throughout the state, and some of them are going to make sure their kids are fed. So what that's resulting in is we're getting multiple applications from the same school district that we're having to work through. So if we could, and, and it's great that everyone is doing everything they can to make sure our kids are fed, but if we can, can at the district level make sure that we're not uh, submitting multiple applications for the same thing, it would help us tremendously in getting those things uh, processed through and, and make sure that we get everyone covered. Um, should schools upload their new calendars to the WAVE? What, what new calendar would that be? We really need to wait until this is over before okay. we start addressing oh, those issues. Oh, next school year? Is that what they're No, thinking? no. They, they've changed their calendar essentially because they're closed. Oh, no. If, no. if we knew this was going to, if we knew, if we knew we had an end date and everything was yeah. set in stone, we could. But yeah. until then, let's not, let's not start moving in that direction. And I guess to that end, should they change their school calendars or vote to change their school calendars? I, I would not advise any changes like that uh, for this time being. We need to get uh, through uh, March 25th board mm -hmm. meeting, and there'll be greater clarity about all this. I, think, I, I don't know if we can answer this question or not, but I'll, I'll pose it. Um, uh, these days off or um, uh, where, where, while school is closed, um, if someone who is using personal leave and headed toward retirement, how does that impact their ability to retire, or does it? I told you you might not be able to answer it. <laughs> Some of these are new. Uh, that's good. There's a, yeah. yeah. Um, good ones on here. That's very important. Yeah. I, I don't know the answers I said here, but we, we can certainly find out and get back. Okay. I think, I mean, I'm just, I'm seeing a lot of duplicate questions and not a lot of other new questions. So we can wait a few minutes and see if there's something that you feel like we haven't addressed. Um, we can try to address that um, again. Uh, when can we expect the updated FAQ? End of the day today. That's the goal. I, I think we've already... Can you deliver two meals at the same time? No, not right now, no. Waiting on a waiver. Okay, so you cannot deliver breakfast and lunch at the same time. Correct. Yes. Jennifer, would you just maybe reiterate um, what schools need to do? So if you have sites that are above the 50%, what is the process they need to go through to gain access to these flexibilities? If they have not done so, they need to apply through the seamless summer option through our CAR system. They will log in, go to the seamless summer option under the checklist, 
and go scroll down to the seamless summer option and request access if that hasn't been done. Please don't do it if you've already done it. They are coming in as fast faster than we can get them logged in to get it going. Once, uh, once access has been requested, an email sent to someone in our office that is dispersing those among multiple people that have been trained on how to do this. They're approving them as fast as we possibly can. Any suggestions for schools on um, foods that are expiring, essentially, that they already have on hand, milks, juices, things like that, that, that have an expiration date? That would. All I'm going to say to that, because I'm not the health department, um, is once they've expired, do not serve them. If you're going to start serving meals next week and your milk expires on that Monday, when meals start being served, you try to get rid of all that milk that same day. Um, but please don't serve expired food. Do they need to keep up with student ID they will when distributing meals? No, meal? no. Okay. They Thank have you. to take a total meal count. Okay. And that information is being sent once approved with a packet right. of information to them on what they need to maintain paperwork-wise. Uh, Brad, could you um, cite the statute for the teacher pay um, sure. that we've been referring to? <clears throat> yeah, it's uh, Title 70, uh, section number 6-101, and subsection H. And that will be in the guidance as well. Um, and we've had some questions about our next call. This is actually something that we've been discussing that we wanted to ask you you all about. Um, how often would it be helpful for us to have these calls? If you'll just enter some your suggestions in the comments here, they're all logged um, and we're able to pull them down afterward. But if you um, you know feel like a call you know every couple of days or how, how frequently would you like these every every week? see somebody said every day um, but if you have suggestions for us on how frequently these would be helpful please let us know okay uh, oh there's a question about the school for the blind and the deaf <clears throat> oh uh, um, they would go they wait, wait. you'll have to repeat the question well, I didn't see the question. Can you? Will the I'm sorry. students from the Oklahoma School of the Blind and the Deaf be able to receive meals as well? They can go to a local area and get meals. They didn't hear the question. Can schools from the blind the, and students, the students, and students, sorry, for the schools for the blind and deaf receive meals? They could go to a local district in their area and pick up meals. Yes, 18 and under. Um. Craig, on um, testing, should schools plan to um, be available to receive materials that are shipping to the school? Are those materials going to be shipped at this time? No, we've asked the vendors to pause on that. Um, questions about graduation requirements. Um, uh, you know, if with the two week closure or if the closure is extended, how does that affect um, graduation requirements for seniors? Uh, the, the state graduation requirements, um, again, this year are local determinations. So that would go with course credits as well. Someone asked me to address the, uh, who can receive meals. It's for children 18 and under. Thank you. Um, we're just kind of scrolling and looking at some of these additional questions. And uh, there was there was a question about a foreign exchange student. Uh, we'll go back and try to find that later. Um, Jennifer, is it advisable um, that schools ask kids to come to school to pick up their food? Um, concerns about lines of children and families standing together and, and possibly being close to one another. We've recommended more of a drive-through type process. Maybe set up the bus circle at schools and have someone with child nutrition, or it doesn't necessarily have to be just someone with child nutrition, that can hand a meal to the people in the car for, for those meals. Not necessarily getting out of the car and going up and getting them, but to actually just drive through and hand off. Okay. And that someone's there to take account as well. At this time, would the children need to be in the car? 
there's been a lot of debate over that with uh, our regional office, and so at this point, I'm, I'm not comfortable giving a yes or a no. Okay. Uh, we will get more information on that. I have another call with um, our regional office tomorrow. Thank you. And let me just reiterate, all your questions are logged and saved. Um, some of them I'm skipping because I know we don't have the answer for them, um, but we will do our best to address all of these, um, as many as possible, in, um, in either the FAQs that we release later today or additional ones um, in the coming days. Um, uh, one more that I, I found that I think um, I know we had maybe planned to address in an, in an FAQ. I'm not sure if it's um, still there or not. But if a student um, in your school community has confirmed that they um, are tested positive for COVID-19, um, what's the recommendation for commu uh, um, communicating that to the school community? Yeah, actually, I think the best way to answer that is to, to say that there's a, uh, a lot of information relating to FERPA, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and even HIPAA that will be set forth in that guidance, very specific as to um, given situations. Um, we're going to be as helpful as we can with a lot of information on FERPA. Mm -hmm. Brad, can you address um, local boards wanting to meet via video during this time? Sure. Uh, you may have to help me out a little bit here. There, my understanding is that there was um, a piece of legislation that passed the Senate this morning um, that would allow local boards as well as the state board and any other public body to meet via video conference or teleconference. Um, is there a need for um, a declaration from um, of a state health officer for teachers to be paid? No, that there's an or in between that in that Title 70 uh, Section 6-101 that was referenced a moment ago. Um, that is a, a portion that's a, an option for that to occur, but we do not read that as a requirement. Um, if schools are aware of um, teachers or students that are still traveling and leaving the state, should they advise them to self-quarantine for 14 days? Yeah, I, I don't think anything has changed as far as that's concerned. Um, if it's changed, it's only... Um, Become more restrictive. Yeah, exactly. And uh, the two weeks after spring break accomplishes that in a very broad way, uh, but if there are those who return much later, then uh, yes, we, we would want you to follow the current CDC guidance at the time. Um, could districts allow a teacher to come to school and work in their classroom, or should they not allow admittance to the building? I think, again, I'm just going to go back to the intent and the, the coverage of the, the board's vote yesterday, which was to stop all instructional activities, staff development, extracurricular activities. And so I, I think maybe the way to ask is we're all in this together and just asking for good faith in applying um, the coverage of that, that board decision. But um, we're, we're it, not saying that a, a teacher is locked out of a building and can't get access to items in their classroom, et cetera. The, the point is a very uniform uh, statement around compelling teachers to teach and conduct business. Uh, the point is that we want teachers to not be congregating or um, compelled to be at school. I think we've answered most all the questions. I um, just want to reiterate a, a couple of pieces of information. Um, it's been brought to my attention uh, regarding certification tests that um, if you go into the uh, to the website, the CEOE website, um, they are posting um, information about certification tests and uh, cancellation and ability to reschedule. So you might um, uh, check there. Additionally, um, just a reminder, this next state board meeting is currently scheduled for next Wednesday, March 25th. Um, and so the board will take up several issues um, that it may need to address um, at that time that have been discussed here and previously. And th go ahead, Brad. I'm just going to mention one thing while it was on my mind. Uh, our certification office will be closed, and so um, no appointments or walk-ins as far as certification fingerprints. 
Um, and then also, I would like to restate the websites that were mentioned earlier for those who didn't have a pen or couldn't write that down at the time. Um, again, the health department has launched their new website specifically to address COVID-19, and that is coronavirus.health.ok.gov. I'll repeat that, coronavirus.health.ok.gov. And then uh, our access to our tools and uh, FAQs at the State Department of Ed website is sde.ok.gov forward slash coronavirus. All right. Okay. And um, Superintendent, is this recorded? Will we be able to share this afterward for those that might have missed the answer to their question? Yes, it will be. And um, I, I see that there are, again, additional questions coming through. We're going to review those and make sure that we reflect that um, if needed in some of the FAQs or address them um, specifically. Um, thank you again, and I appreciate you joining the call. Um, and I think that this is uh, probably a really good time to break. Um, we will continue to have these as the need arises, but um, we'll, we'll reflect on some of the comments and uh, see where we have a consensus on how to schedule or when to schedule this next. Uh, take care. I really appreciate all of your leadership and the work that you're doing in schools, making decisions uh, that are flexible and best meet uh, the needs of the families that we all serve. So I appreciate you all. Take care and, and stay safe.